West End Games was formed in 1974 by Daniel Scott Poulter. While they were primarily a war game company at first, they didn't enter the role-playing game business until 1984 with the cult hit Paranoia. Two years later, they would develop their line of Ghostbusters games with a frightfully cheerful RPG, setting the stage for arguably their biggest contribution to the hobby, the D6 system, which is debatably the first game to use a die pool mechanic. It was in 1987 that they acquired the Star Wars license, releasing the first edition of the Star Wars RPG. This was a surprising move at the time, since it was three years removed from Return of the Jedi closing the doors on Star Wars, well, as far as everyone knew at the time, in terms of new material. The result was a resounding success, and one of the major factors that helped add momentum to the expanded universe that was already starting to gain speed through the Tales of the Jedi comic. Most famously, when Timothy Zahn had been hired to write the Thrawn trilogy, West Stand had been commissioned to send several source books to him for reference material at the request of Lucasfilm. Many alien names, such as the Twi'lek, traced their origins to West End books as well. Sadly, mismanagement of West End's parent company, Bucci Retail, caused the latter to go under, taking West End games with it. This would be a occurring affair of peaks and valleys with West End throughout their history, but that's a story for another time. While there were several editions covered during the initial publishing run, for the purposes of this review, I'll be covering the revised and expanded rule set from 1996 as I feel that it's the most definitive take on what was officially published. You'll see why I use that wording specifically later on. At about 288 pages long, the book gets its messages across fairly easily. There's only a couple of hiccups that I'll get into in a bit, but even 20 plus years later it's aged better than some other games of its time. The book's design is certainly well done, but it's a bit inconsistent. I'd owe this to the use of color how certain rules are laid out. Not helping matters is the attempt to mix stills from the movies with their own artwork. And while the artwork is good, I'd have honestly preferred they stuck to one approach or the other. I will admit this is nitpicky on my part, but I feel like some of the uses of color in the book clashes with the aesthetic. I'm not asking for everything to be brown, but stuff like text boxes and some of the asides feel like an editor long since envied books with color and now finally got their chance to put full color in the book. Then again, this is the 90s where everything had to be ridiculously colorful. Interestingly, each of the chapters has this informal tone as if you're being told this info by an in-universe character. I like this approach since it adds to the immersion and feel, especially since they didn't use too many characters in this regard, at most three. As a final note, while I appreciate that they kept an index, a major pet peeve of mine when books don't, having a blank character sheet in the early parts of the book and not at the end bugs the hell out of me. West End Games broke new ground with their inclusion of character templates as opposed to pre-generated sample characters. To my knowledge, a first for the industry. So obviously, the first step in character creation is choosing one of these templates. Now while the option is given to create your own, we'll focus on the ones present in the book for now. For the sake of example, let's pick the Young Jedi template. In step 2, you give yourself 7 die to spend on your character's skills. You can increase a skill with 1 die or 2. Alternatively, you can spend a die to give yourself three die to use for a specialization of a skill, i.e. specialization in blaster pistols when using the blaster skill. The ability to use the force is determined by three specific skills, control, sense, and alter. These skills may be improved with the aforementioned die, but only if the template already has the skill. So in this example, we've given one point to dodge, two points to melee combat, one point to melee parry, one point to search, one point to languages, and one point to blaster repair, bringing us to a total of seven. Third, we have to determine if the character's force sensitive or not. If they are, they start with two force points, otherwise they start only with one. Fourth, if the template has any credits in their equipment list, this is where you'd spend those credits on weapons, armor, and ships as permitted. Looking at the template, this character would start with two sets of clothing, an R2 astromech droid, and a blaster pistol, as well as 500 credits, 250 of which in this case have been spent to use a vibroblade. Finally, if the template has at least one force skill trained, the character starts with force powers as appropriate. In the case of this template, we have three force powers. Going through the available ones, we pick concentration, magnify senses, and telekinesis for this example. Template creation is in the back of this chapter, and while it has a set of guidelines, I consider this more for the GM than for players. Fortunately, it's not entirely point by the way some other games can be with this sort of mechanic. However, it's something I can only recommend after you've played a few sessions of the game itself. This game uses West End's D6 system. 
and like many narrative style games, it's a die pool of attribute plus skill. The game has six primary attributes. Dexterity, knowledge, mechanical, perception, strength, and technical. Skills denote what a character has learned and are always linked to a certain attribute. For instance, Blaster is always linked to Dexterity. When making a roll, you add the respective die codes of the attribute and skill and roll that many d6s, adding the resulting die together with any modifiers and compare against the difficulty number. If you beat the number, you succeed. However, there is a monkey wrench thrown into this with the wild die. This is meant to be a different color die than the others, but it will explode on a 6 and implode on a 1. The final part of the basics are the game's extra effort mechanic, character points and force points. When spending a character point, you can add one extra die before rolling. Force points, however, are more powerful, allowing you to roll double the number of die you could roll in a given round, but you cannot use both of these at once. Mechanically, I'd say it's quite viable and accessible, but there's a couple nitpicks I do have. The first is an on-principle one with the character points. This is because I'm not a fan of using a resource used for improvement and extra effort at the same time. In both narrative and mechanics, these should be separate affairs in my opinion. Secondly is something related to combat. I find the attack roll defense roll approach as laid out to be a bit clunky. Instead of having them as separate rolls, I'd rather it be a contested roll than have an attacker and defender roll separately. I'm aware that combat is supposed to have a degree of lethality in this game, but I think a sense of action is more vital here. More often than not, games made in a certain time period have not aged well for one reason or another. Star Wars D6 is one of the rare exceptions to this rule, playing as good as now as it did in 1996. It's a very easy to pick up system, with a fair bit of crunch in places, Starship Combat especially, which I unfortunately wasn't able to get to. However, if you like a fair bit of crunch and depth in character actions, I would hesitate to recommend this to you. The strength of the D6 system is its simplicity, not so much its depth. Additionally, this is a game that's very clearly built around the timeline of the original trilogy and the New Republic era. If you're a fan of the Old Republic or some of the adaptations outside of that era, this may not have as much for you right outside of the box. Unfortunately, the game is out of print, and has been for quite some time. But all is not lost, as there are plenty of places online to find the original books in PDF form. Also, places like D6 Holocron and a few others have added new material that covers other eras, as well as conversion from the later games we'll be touching on in this series. In 2004, the West End name was revived by Purgatory Publishing, releasing a series of generic D6 entries based around adventure, space, and fantasy. Each of these are free in PDF form on DriveThruRPG. The space version in particular is essentially the Star Wars RPG with the license filed off. There are also two attempts to refine the game beyond the book we've discussed in this video. First is what's been referred to as the re-up version by Womp Rat Press, and the second is a much more expanded third edition by Legendary X Gamer. In addition, while I was editing this review, I caught wind that the current license holder, Fantasy Flight Games, has announced a re-release of the original edition and the Star Wars sourcebook for its 30th anniversary. At the time of this recording, it is still in pre-order, but it's worth checking out at the very least. Bear in mind, however, that this is the first edition that they're re-releasing, not the revised version that we've been covering in this video. Personally, given all of that, I would recommend starting with Revised and Expanded first and foremost. If you liked that and you want more options, then move to the re-up version. If you like tinkering around with the system, then go for the third edition. Bottom line, West End Games' Star Wars RPG was a milestone for both RPGs and for Star Wars itself, helping add fuel to the expanded universe and demonstrating the viability of a dice pool mechanic to a wide audience. But as I mentioned before, the license was lost in 1998 when the company folded. Two years later, Wizards of the Coast acquired the license and released their own version under the D20 system. But that is another story.